Some of you have been coming to this church um, for a while, and so you probably know me a little bit, and you kind of know my story and my background. The people who are joining us today by the power of technology in California have known me a lot longer, and so they definitely know my background. And one of the things that you've heard me say, if you've been going here any amount of time, is I never really wanted to be a pastor. I mean, I really didn't. And, and there are many days I still don't, but most of the time I'm pretty okay with it. But that really wasn't my vision for myself, even as a Christian. Uh, I went to a big church in Atlanta, and we had some very successful business people in that church. And we even had some people who I would say were business giants. I mean, like uh, amazing, creative, smart um, business people, creative, and of course, not just massively successful, but massively generous. And it was my vision to serve God in that way. That's what I really wanted to do. Uh, I looked to the pastor to bring me my teaching, but I looked to some of the elders and the business leaders in the church to be my mentors because I didn't want to be like him. I wanted to be like them. Now, God does what he wants to do, and he, he made my path go in a different direction. Uh, but that's who I saw myself as. And I saw myself as somebody who wanted to uh, make a profit and be generous with it and leverage it to establish the kingdom of God to support my church, to support missions, to support missionaries who were out in the field. That was my vision. I mean, that's what I grew up believing that I would be, and that's what I grew up believing that I would do. And then when I became a follower, that's what I thought I would do for God. And I think that's a wonderful vision to have. It just, of course, has to be God. And so I would say that that continues to affect my personality to this day. I was probably 35 years old when I became a pastor. I was just slightly younger than that when I preached my first sermon. I didn't begin my uh, theological education until I was in my 30s. All my training had been in business. And so that's very much in me. That's kind of wired into who I am. And so some of, some of you may wonder why my personality is what it is and why my approach is what it is. Well, that's who I am, and, and it affects everything. And so today's parable about the, the, par the parable of the talents, uh, the more modern versions call it the parable of the bags of gold, uh, the parable about what we're to do with worldly wealth for the kingdom of God is very attractive to me. I like it. Uh, I'm encouraged by it. I understand it. it. It really resonates with me. I don't think it's the favorite parable of everybody because a lot of us are very uncomfortable mixing, mixing our religion and our money. Uh, maybe we're okay with mixing our religion and our politics, but we don't like to mix our religion and our money, our, our, our sum total of our life and our work and our wealth. Um, that may be the centerpiece, but our spirituality, whether we state it or admit it or not, are kind of around the peripheral. But Scripture won't allow us to do that. Time and time again, uh, God shows us that he isn't a, a God to be worshipped around the peripheral. He's a God that wants to sit right in the center of our lives. And, and what I love about this parable is Jesus makes that very clear. And, and he takes belief out of the realm of the simply theological or the theoretical or the philosophical. He takes a teaching of the kingdom of God out of kind of the, out of space and brings it down to earth. And he makes it very, very tangible and he makes it very, very real. To me, it's incredibly encouraging that God wants to be so powerful and creative in this portion of our life, that he wants us to worship him in this center place. But at the same time, it's incredibly challenging because we begin to understand it's not just what we do with our spiritual gifts. It's not just what we do with our time in church. It's what we do with our uh, more tangible, more earthly gifts and what we do with our time in all spaces and places that God wants to see faithfulness. So it's convicting and it's challenging, but I think if we read it in the right way, it's also inspiring and incredibly encouraging, uh, this parable and the teaching like this. People say to me all the time, why, do you, why are you so unabashed about preaching about money? Well, one, because I, I told you who I am. That's my personality. Uh, number two, I know that this is where our money is there, our heart is also. This is right in the center of who we are and what we really believe and how we really feel. And the other reason, believe it or not, is because we preach systematically through Scripture, and the Bible talks about this topic as much or more than anything else, because God knows what I know and what I bet you know, which is this is so central to what we really believe and where our affections truly lie. 
Anyway, this picks up in Matthew uh, chapter 25, verse 14. It is the third parable in a sequence of parables in this section of scripture. There are some more in chapter 13. There are about 24 parables in all in the, in, in the gospel of Matthew, of which we really haven't gotten into any of them. Um, I'm disappointed because I really thought I would do a lot of teaching from the parables. And really, it was like the Kingdom of Heaven series was my introduction in one parable. And so there, there may be a Kingdom of Heaven series part two where I preach all the, all the parables in the Kingdom of Heaven. There's, there's probably 31 of them, so it would take about half a year. So we'll put that off for now. Um, but I cherry-picked this one. This is the one that I really wanted to talk about today, again, because it's tangible. And the purpose of this series to me has been for us to rethink about the kingdom of heaven as not simply something that exists in heaven, but something that we are to make manifest on earth, um, to make tangible on earth. And so this one I thought was an appropriate finale to the series, part A. Like I said, hopefully we'll do a part B um, one day down the road. But beginning in, in verse 14, Jesus is speaking. And remember, he's doing this in the sequence of all these parables, okay? And I'm gonna tell you what the first couple are before this, and I'm gonna tell you what the next one is after this in a minute. But, but all of these parables are kind of interwoven. And so this is, this is an aspect of his teaching on the kingdom of heaven. This isn't the entirety of his teaching on the kingdom of heaven. And these parables, I would encourage you to go through and read them in sequence because they really do build off of each other uh, in, a, in a way that is kind of nice. But anyway, picking up in verse 14, this is like the third in this segment, Jesus says again, in other words, a reiteration of what I'm saying, another way of thinking about what I'm saying, another parable. And by the way, a parable is a, is a simple, short story given to illustrate something, a message of deep meaning, right? And Jesus was, he was the perfecter of the parable. He wasn't the first one to use a parable, but he was the perfecter of the parable. And the reason I think he spoke so often in parables as he was saying so much so quickly that he wanted to give an illustration that had so much dynamic to it and then later give the church the Holy Spirit and the ability to interpret it in, in, in all of its depth. And so this is, this is one of those teachings where he said so much more in an illustration than he could have said with many words. Uh, anyway, we really will read it this time. It says, again, it will be like a man going on a journey. When, when the kingdom of heaven um, fully makes itself manifest on earth, um, it will be like a man going on a journey. This is, he's kind of speaking about the period of time between his existence on earth right now. He's the man, the son of man, the master. And he's going to go on a journey. He's going to die. He's going to ascend to heaven. He's going to continue to come by his Holy Spirit, but he won't physically come again until, he, until his second coming, which is when the kingdom of heaven will be made fully manifest on earth. And this period between his first coming and his second coming is this incremental period where the kingdom is breaking in, but it's not fully visible and fully manifest yet. So he's saying, it will be like a man going on a journey. This is the, this is the era that you guys exist in right now. So this man goes on a journey and he called his servants and he entrusted his wealth to them. His wealth to them. Entrusted not wealth to them, but his wealth to them. To one, he gave five bags of gold. You may be more familiar with the teaching on the talents, five talents. To another, two bags. And to another, one bag. Each according to their ability, not to, according to how much he liked them, but according to his providence, according to his purposes, according to how he wired them, where he called them to be, what he called them to do in their precise circumstances, not out of a, a, a sense of favoritism, but he gave them according to their ability, and I would even say according to their purpose. And then he went on his journey. And so he's, he's the man, he's the master, and his disciples who were hearing this message, the ones that were present at that moment, including us, well, we're his servants. And what he's saying is, whether you see it or not, whether you perceive it or not, I have entrusted upon you wealth. Now, traditionally, this would have been interpreted primarily spiritual gifts. But if we really look into the passage and, and, and define the terms, that's not in this particular place what he's talking about. In this particular place, he's talking about our more earthly gifts our more earthly talents, our more earthly abilities, and the wealth or the profit, the literal cash it creates. 
That's what he's talking about. The reason the modern translators have changed talents to, to bags of gold is because, because American English-speaking people, people in our context, have read that and we have over-spiritualized it. The word talent actually meant a measure of weight for a fine metal. That, that's what it really means. It, it doesn't mean... Um, I'm good at praying for people. It doesn't mean I'm good at explaining the Bible. It doesn't mean that I preach or I teach or I prophesy or anything like that. That, that That is certainly a spiritual talent, so to speak, and most certainly a spiritual gift and something that we are to be faithful with. And the principles that are true about our earthly wealth are most certainly true about our spiritual wealth. But in this particular parable, he's talking about your cash. And most translators think he was probably talking about the measurement that he would have probably most been talking about is gold. And it wouldn't have been a piece of gold or five pieces of gold and two pieces of gold and one piece of gold. Each talent would have been 75 pounds of gold. It would have been a bag of gold. So one guy was given five 75-pound bags of gold. Another person was given two 75-pound bags of gold. And another person was given one pound or one bag, one 75-pound bag of gold. Today's dollars, that would have been 1.25 million for the one who received the one bag, $2.5 million who received the two bags, and $6.25 million for the person who received five bags. Now, you may say, gosh, boy, our pastor really is a business guy. He's all about the money. Well, that's how they heard it then, and that's how we need to hear it now. It was cash. It was money. And I don't think it was... Jesus saying to his servants, um, I'm going to give you $6.25 million. I want you to take this literally, but I want you to think about it a little bit more abstractly than that. This is the sum total worth of your life's, of your life's work. Uh, your, your earthly abilities, your earthly opportunities, your, your earthly education, the economy you exist in. I'm leaving you, I'm entrusting you with considerable talents and I'm even enhancing that by the power of the Holy Spirit to give you covering, to give you creativity, to give you inspiration and understanding like, like no one has ever had before. And the, the sum total of your life work is, is immense. And some, you know, it's more immense than others. Um, it's not about favoritism, but it's immense. And this is, of course... This is what he's talking about. Now, it's interesting here that he emphasized that it was entrusted to them. Uh, to be entrusted with something is really, it's, 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 it's really quite powerful and liberating, yet kind of um, awesome with its responsibility at the same time. It, it wouldn't have been untypical in, in the time of Jesus for a wealthy person to entrust his servant with wealth and give them incredible freedom to use it according to their abilities and to, the, and to some degree their own discretion. In, in other words, they would endow them with it as if it was almost theirs and they would have been allowed to meet their own needs out of it and they would have been allowed to make decisions with it and they would have done it based on the trust and the relationship they had with their master and, and the abilities that they had and kind of the commission that went along with it. And so Jesus is saying, that's kind of what I'm doing with you. And, and you're going to have a lot of freedom and you're going to have this for quite some time. And you've got to remember that at the end of the day, even though it feels like it's yours, it's not really yours. And even though I may not literally have handed it to you with, with a ledger that said, okay, I gave you this, and what comes out of it is mine, in the spiritual realm, if you peel back the scene, that's exactly what God has done with all of us. Anyway, the passage goes on and says, the man who had received... The five bags of gold, the 6.25 million, went at once and put his money to work and gained five more bags. Now, this is a parable. This is a simple short story. Jesus does want us to take this literally to a degree and understand he is talking about tangible wealth. But what we also understand is is that the requirements of God are not simply to take money and make more money, right? We got to look at the fullness of scripture and everything it teaches us in order to interpret this part correctly as well. 
There was another place, another story that Jesus told where a man had gained great wealth for himself and he had done a great job of taking that and increasing it and multiplying it, but not for the purposes of God, but for the purposes of himself. And he stored away his great wealth in a barn and he said, now I'm gonna sit back and and be happy and, and live a nice, long, fun life. And then Jesus said that night, his life was demanded of him and And God was mad at him because he was generous towards himself without being generous towards God, which means without being generous towards people. So faithfulness, the faithfulness that Jesus is encouraging through this passage is not simply about being industrious and creating an increase. It's about taking that increase and leveraging it for the true treasures to God, which are people. And, you know, we're in Matthew 25 here, and we're going to hit the grand finale. We're not going to get there because we've already kind of, you know, got there in advance, and this is our last sermon. But the grand finale of the whole gospel is the Great Commission. That is the application. So the implication, because of that application, is to look at this and go, okay, what he means is I'm supposed to take the sum total of my life, my life work, act like it's his and not mine, not only be faithful with it and take risks with it and, uh, and, and seize opportunity with it and create increase with it, but take that increase and leverage it for the purposes of God, which is to invest it in the mission of God, which is most best articulated in the Great Commission. So that's... That's what God is looking for. That's what Jesus is looking for. A a literal application, but the real outcome is people. People coming into a life-saving relationship with him. The only eternal wealth that is tangible uh, on earth, in a sense, are people. Everything in the heavens and earth is going to pass away. It's going to be not utterly gone, but it's going to be transformed and reformed and all brought under the government of God. But the one thing that we have that we can take with us through that transformation is each other. And so this is about not storing up treasures on earth, but storing up treasures in heaven through people, but using the treasures we have on earth. So also the one with two bags gained two more bags. So he did good too. He did exactly the same thing. He got the exact same return in proportion to what he was given. But the man who had received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. He he didn't, uh, the way I interpret this and some other people, you know, that I've read and another pastor I heard, it wasn't so much that he hid a piece of gold in the ground until the master came back. It was as if he, he held, he hoarded, and he kept it to himself. And, and, and maybe there was no increase because he didn't need an increase because he already had enough for himself and, and, he, and if he wasn't going to leverage it, of course, for others. And so that would probably be the best uh, interpretation of that passage in a way that would make sense to us. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and he settled accounts with them. Now, after a long time, uh, in, the, in the lead up to this parable and the parable just preceding this, it was all about dealing with this period of time. Uh, chapter 24 began with Jesus talking, not in a parable, but talking about the end times, talking about the destruction of the temple, talking about what the atmosphere in the world would be like when he returned. And he made it very clear that people are going to come and they're going to say they're me. People are going to come and they're going to fill you with fear that it's the end of times and there's going to be earthquakes and there's going to be wars and there's going to be pestilences. and There's going to be all these terrible things happening in the atmosphere. But he's saying, don't worry and don't be deceived keep your head down, keep doing your work because this gospel will be preached to the ends of the earth and then and only then will I return. Uh, We also know that after the flood, uh, God said that seed time and harvest would never end until Christ returned on the second coming and made the kingdom fully manifest on earth. And so he was telling them in, in advance of this, there's going to be all kinds of things that tell you to stop. There's going to be all kinds of things that tell you to be fearful. There's going to be all kinds of things that, that, that stop you in your tracks. And you may even have a sense that you're being faithful to God in your fear by, by halting existing in the world and, and becoming disengaged. But don't listen to it and don't have anything to do with it. 
You got to remain faithful. And then he went on to say that it will be very, very good for his faithful servants who continue to serve people, uh, even if it takes a long time, seemingly a long time for him to come. And it will be very, very bad for his servants if they become unfaithful because it takes so long that they forget or think he's just not coming. And then it segs right into this. And so after a long time, when it would have been very easy to forget that it's God who gave us our life and everything that it consists of. After a long time, when it would be very easy to think, well, he's not really coming. After a long time and a lot of rationalization and a lot of time in the world and a lot of time in the thinking of the world and not enough time in the thinking and the anticipating of the coming of the kingdom of God, and the imminence of the coming is, in, is the coming of the kingdom is imminent, but it's not immediate. And so after a long time when they could have forgotten, the master did return. And he returned to settle the accounts that they had with him. The man who had received the five bags of gold brought the other five. And he said, Master, you have entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I have gained five more. Now, in this simple parable, it was very easy for him to see that he had treasure. He increased his treasure. And now he was presenting the increased treasure back to his master who was going to be pleased because he did what he was supposed to do. Now for us, it's a little more abstract. It's a little harder to see the fruit of our existence. As a pastor, uh, it won't be how much money we have in the bank. If that's the true application of this passage, then I'm in deep trouble. They need to add actually a fourth guy. One guy gained five, one guy gained two, one guy hid his, and then Pastor Brian needed three more in a couple weeks to pay off his debts. So that's not really what he's saying, but he's saying for for the purpose of simplification, he made it simple. But what he's really saying is it's going to be all apparent when I return. You know, right now I preach and, and people hear me and here and, 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 and there and people hear me on the internet and, and maybe they respond to the work I do by grace through faith, by the washing of the blood, filled with the Holy Spirit, all glory to God, and they respond and some become believers and some become followers and, and, and some I can see and a lot I can't see. And, and there are things that you do, you, there's things that you invest in, not just spiritually, but financially, the church, your ties, your missions, it, it, children through Compassion International, and uh, there's just all these different ways that you invest, even through your career and the influence that you have on people, and sometimes you see the results, and sometimes you don't. But the cool thing is, when Christ returns, everything is laid bare before him to whom we must give an account, and everything becomes immediately apparent. I don't know to what degree that might be true, but we will have a strong sense of the value of our life work when we see him face to face. There'll be no uh, falsifying the balance sheet. There'll be no, you know, building up the profit. It'll, it will be what it is, and, and it will be absolutely apparent to us, and it will be absolutely apparent to God. And, and at that moment, we'll receive a response from God based on the reckoning of those accounts. Now, the good news is, for those of us who are in Christ, this doesn't mean perfection or perfection in performance. We know that he has paid the price for our sins, and we will be presented before his throne without blemish or fault. And so the only thing left to talk about will be the things that we did as we were led and inspired by his Holy Spirit to do. Whether they were tangible and and earthly or whether they were spiritual, they all ended up being spiritual. And so there's nothing to fear here unless, of course, we never really belong to him. Anyway, this guy is having his moment with God and he's showing the increase. Uh, For you and me, it may look different. I think for me, uh, my number one conviction out of this tangible parable is I feel really responsible to not just have a church, but to plant churches. And not just to be a pastor, but to raise up pastors. And not just to be a disciple, but to make disciples that look a lot like the good servants in this parable. That's what I feel responsible for. That is ultimately what I want to show to God. And in some form, I bet that's true for you too. It may not be direct, it may be indirect, but that's what, you know, that's the, that's the tangible form of the investment of the sum total on my life that I want to show God. And that means that I use my spiritual gifts, but it also means I use my earthly abilities and wealth and leverage the confluence of those things 
to produce this outcome. That's what I want to show to God. And this is the response that I want to hear, and I bet you want to hear too. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. Exclamation, well, he yelled it. I'm not going to yell at you today. Sometimes I do. I'm not today. I'm already kind of yelling. Well done, my good and faithful servant. What a thing to hear from God. Not well done, my perfect servant, but well done, my faithful servant. Again, this is not about performance or perfection. This is about faithfulness. He says, you have been faithful with a few things. Now I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share in your master's happiness. Now we know the ultimate, uh, the epitome of this verse will be when Christ returns to us the second time in physical form, or we close our eyes here and open them there and we return to him. The epitome of this will be then. And the Lord will say, well done, my good and faithful servant. You weren't perfect, but I came to you and you received me. You received the gospel. You were washed in my blood. You were filled with my Holy Spirit. And you learned to incrementally and increasingly surrender your life to me. And because you did that, there were all these wonderful and powerful outcomes where I worked through you. And so you were faithful on earth. Now I'm going to bless you in heaven. And now not only are you my servants... You are sons and daughters of the Father and joint heirs with Christ. Uh, Enter into my eternal pleasure. That would be the uh, the epitome of the application of verse 21, and you really don't have to do a lot to reinterpret it for that moment, but we know through the fullness of Scripture, that's the kind of encounter that we have to look forward to. But I believe that there's an application for this even now. I think there are times, and go with me here, this is a little abstract for you, but I believe that there are times in time and space where it's as if the the master returns, Christ returns, and he takes an appraisal of our life. And he says, you know what? You've been faithful with a little. Now I'm going to give you more. Not only am I going to leave in your hands, notice that he didn't take anything. He he was generous to entrust in the first place. There was increase and he left it in their hands in the second place. And then he promises to give more. And it's as if he's going to say, not only am I going to give you what you have, I'm going to give you the breakthroughs that you've been asking me for. I'm going to give you a promotion in the kingdom on earth, even before heaven, because you've been faithful with a little. I want you to be faithful with more. You're getting my word done for me. And I have found that I can trust you. And so I don't believe this is about just the ultimate kingdom to come. I believe in, in, in accordance with the purpose of this series, which is to understand that the kingdom has already come, not fully, but incrementally. And we're not going to just one day enter the kingdom of God, but we're in the process of entering the kingdom of God. And it's not just about it as well being done then, but on earth as it will be done then. I believe this happens now. And the really exciting thing about this is that, that this isn't just a mood the master was in. He was stating a law, a principle. Embedded in this parable is a principle, which is those who are faithful with little, God will give much. And those who are unfaithful with little would be the reciprocation, and we'll see this at the end. Uh, well, they won't be given much. They may won't be given anything. And so, this is challenging. This is convicting. This causes us to examine our life and how we spend it. But this is also encouraging. Because did you know, the Lord doesn't need us to do anything he wants to do. He blesses us and esteems us to be included in his business. And and if, if, if to whom much is given, much is demanded, then the reciprocation of that is true as well. If I'm giving much to him, if I'm surrendered to him, then then I can expect a lot out of him as well. That's an absolutely reciprocated law. And so we see that embedded in the scripture. Very encouraging, very convicting, very challenging, but very inspiring all at the same time all at the same time. And this isn't just about when the king comes one day, it's when he comes in time and space, even today. By the way, in my opinion, my humble opinion. In my opinion, I see the breaking in of the kingdom of God throughout all of it. The fact 
that, that this servant had the power to take five and turn it into 10 meant that the power and the manifestation of the kingdom was coming incrementally and subtly all along. It is really interesting to me that there, there, isn't, there really isn't that fourth outcome. There may be temporary, temporary setbacks and, and difficult times that we go through. I absolutely understand that. And I, I know that many people suffer. I, I, I'm not unaware of the complexities. I believe that the kingdom of God is already coming, but is not yet fully manifest. But I see, I see in all of this a constant breaking in. Almost a promise from God. It's as if he's coming to us to say, today and saying, as much as I want to challenge you and convict you, I want to encourage you. I want to come right into the center of your life where most of you challenge or are challenged and you stress and you worry the most. And I want to take that area of where you're just trying to survive and give you the ability to thrive. I really hope with all my heart that's what you perceive today. I don't know if you do or not because this is gonna require that you test your heart and really see where you are with God. But I'm telling you, there is incredible implied promises here. Heck, they're pretty direct. I don't even think they're implied. Anyway, the man with two bags of gold also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two bags of gold and see, I've gained two more. Same outcome, going to receive the same response from God, exactly the same. And, 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 and he didn't have less and do less because God thought less. It was just according to his abilities and according to the purposes of God. Sometimes uh, I'm tempted to compare myself to others. I'm sure you are as well. And this is Jesus coming and saying, hey, it is not about comparison. It's not about competition. It's just about doing what you've been called to do. And, and some people have been given this broad array of, of opportunities with incredible expectations before them. And some of you work a little niche. But in the grand scheme of things, at the end of time, I'm not going to laud them any more than I laud you. Uh, maybe I'm not the pastor with five talents. Maybe I'm the pastor with like 1.2, which is pretty good. Maybe I'm not responsible before God to create a mega church. Maybe I'm responsible before God to plant churches that multiply and make disciples. And maybe my thing is a little different than their thing. And God is saying, hey, in, in, in understanding these, these, this tangible peril, parable with its demand for tangible results, I don't want you to get caught up in performance or comparison or competition. I want you to understand first and foremost, entirely actually, it's about faithfulness and it's about love. And it's about faithfulness because you believe and you have a level of fear, but mostly it's about love and your affection and putting your money where your mouth is. And so he did the exact same thing and he got the exact same result and he got the exact same response from God according to his purpose. There might've been a guy with 10 talents above the one uh, that we first talked about. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. Not just at the end of time, but in time and in space. You have been faithful with a few things. I will come and put you in charge of many things. Come and share in your master's happiness. Exactly the same as the first guy. Then the man, okay, now the plot thickens. You guys have probably read this and you know what's about to happen, but just pretend you haven't. I wonder what's going to happen with the third guy. You know, all these guys look kind of the same, right? They're all entrusted servants. They all give lip service to God. They all seem to be stewards to some degree. As we understand, it's not according uh, to God's love for them or his affection for them or how they will even ultimately be rewarded that they have been given what they've been given. They've been given according to their abilities, which is more about providence than anything else. God is no respecter of men. And so they look the same. And the first two guys look pretty darn faithful. And the third guy looks pretty unfaithful, but he doesn't look like a God denier. He looks like a God believer. I mean, he looks okay, and I think when we read this, we might can understand where he's coming from, but you're going to notice the, the most severe response from Jesus to this guy. And it's going to trouble you a little bit. Heck, it might trouble you a lot. It's probably supposed to. Anyway, without further ado, the man who had received the one bag of gold came. Master, he said. Now, remember the last time we were together, we were in a passage where Jesus said, not everyone who calls me Lord 
will enter the kingdom of heaven. Remember that? He said, many, many will come that day calling me Lord. But I will say to them, I never knew you. I knew about you, you knew about me, but we did not have that special intimate covenant relationship. You didn't know me. Now, it's about to be evident that this guy who calls him Lord, who calls him master, does not know him because he is about to malign him and mischaracterize him. Master, he said, I knew that you are a hard man. Now, he thinks he's being respectful, but he's being quite insulting, especially if you put this in context to what someone would say to Christ the Savior and to his, their benevolent Father in heaven. I knew that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. He's accusing him of being mean, and he's accusing him of being a thief. Let's be very clear about what he's saying here. Harvesting where you have not sown. This is a guy who after a long period of time forgot that he's the one who entrusted him in the first place, that the, that the master sowed into him, gave him great freedom, great liberty, great ability, great opportunity, enhanced that in our context with the spirit of God, and then the guy comes back one day and it's been so long he forgot that he gave it to him in the first place. And so he accuses him of being a thief. He also accuses him of being mean when all he's done has been generous and poured into his life. He said, I know you want to gather where, where, where you have not sown and, and, and where you have not scattered seed. And I remind you, if we reverse back, that actually when the master came, he, didn't, he still didn't take anything. They still had what he gave them. They had the increase that they had earned. And he even gave them more. And so this guy, this is a man who does not know the master. He doesn't know him, and, he, and, he, and he's telling lies. So I was afraid and went out and hid your gold in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. I've kept it by myself. I've been shrewd in a sense, and I did it because I'm afraid of you, and I'm afraid to take a risk because I thought you might punish me if I took a risk and the risk failed. Well, you know, you and I, when we refuse to take a risk, uh, what we're basically saying is that we don't believe. God-given, God-inspired risk is absolutely essential to faith working itself out as love. And this guy didn't do it. He wouldn't do it. He maligned him. He mischaracterized him. He, he didn't know him. Therefore, he wasn't able to hear him. And because he wasn't able to hear him, he didn't remain tethered to him. He wasn't able to respond to him. He wasn't able to remain faithful to him. And there was no outcome. There was nothing leveraged for the purposes of the master. His master replied, so much embedded here. His master replied, you wicked, lazy servant. And he was yelling again. Now, now, interestingly, in the first line, he doesn't accept the premise of what the guy said. And in the second line, he does. But in the first line, he, he really does diagnose the guy. When he says wicked, that can really only mean one thing centrally. That means you selfish. The epitome of wickedness is selfishness. The mark of the beast is the mark of selfishness. Now, ultimately, what was, the, was, what was the original sin? It was pride, it was self-exaltation, a sense of self-sufficiency and self-centeredness. You, you, you self-centered man is what he's saying, and, and you lazy man. You had enough for you, and, and you weren't willing to do the work and leverage it because you didn't care about the needs of others. That's, that's really the way I read this. You selfish, lazy servant, unfaithful, unwilling to take a risk, unfaith-filled, unfaith-filled and unlove-filled. So you knew, did you? He's accepting the premise for the moment, only in, to convict him with his own words. In, in, in Luke chapter 19, there's a, there's a parable almost identical to this that's in, in some substantive ways different, but that these exact lines are there. And, and in, that ver, in that passage, it literally says that the Lord used his words uh, to judge him. 
In other words, he's not accepting what he's saying. He's just saying, if you were even telling the truth about how you felt towards me, there would still be a different outcome. Some would say the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Some would say it is a great and noble thing to fear God. And some would look at this and say, hey, maybe he didn't have it all figured out, but at least he feared God. But Jesus is calling him out and saying, you didn't really fear me. Because if you had feared me, there would have been a better outcome than this. Now, the fear of the Lord may be the beginning of wisdom, but it is the love of God that is the fulfillment of it. And that's where these other men had arrived. And this is something that he never arrived at. But he's basically calling him out even on his lie. He's saying, your lie is a lie. So you knew, did you, that I harvest where I have not sown, a lie, and gather where I have not scattered seed, a lie, question mark. So let's just accept your premise for the moment. Well, then... At a minimum, you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. You wouldn't come waltzing out here in front of me without giving me my money back and giving me interest on top of it if you really believed I was to be feared. But what you didn't believe is that I had given it to you in the first place. What you didn't believe was that I was ever going to come back. Because from your perspective, though it was imminent, it wasn't immediate, you just didn't believe. And you didn't respond. And you knew about me, but you didn't know me. Because if you knew, if you really knew me, you would know that I'm not a hard man. I'm compassionate, I'm tender, I'm loving. God is love. Patient, kind, humble, gentle. Yes, holy, in a sense, wrathful for those who don't respond to his love, like this man right here. There, there's a term, in, a theological term, it's called imputed righteousness. And it's a theological term, and it's an important term, because it reminds us that we cannot create righteousness in and of ourselves. It's something that is given to us through the washing of the blood of the Holy Spirit, of Christ, and by the power of the Holy Spirit inside of us. And it's an important term, and it's a term that theologians talk about, but it's not a term that Jesus ever used, although some of his teaching, you could derive it from that. Um, but it's a term, and it's an important term. And, and it's an important term because we understand that our righteousness are but, is but rags before God, and we really rely on the righteousness of Christ when we go before God. We all understand that. It's imputed righteousness. And and it's very important for our sense of assurance that he who started a work in us will bring it forth to completion and our imperfections won't be held against us uh, when we go before the throne. We will indeed be without blemish, though we are not without blemish yet. And so that's important theological work. But, but what Jesus is saying here is kind of what Paul said, and Paul was the great writer of, about grace. He's saying, if righteousness has truly been imputed upon you, then the Holy Spirit has been put inside of you and there should be evidence of it. Right? That's why Paul taught, and you hear me say often, to test yourself. Test yourself. And see, is there any evidence that you're truly walking in the faith? And Jesus brings this parable, and he goes, right in the sum total worth of your life, in the central part of where you exist and how you survive, in, in, in the tangible area of the wealth that God has given you, uh, maybe not handed to you in a bag of cash, but gained through the confluence of your gifts, your talents, and your abilities, employed in this world with your education and with your opportunities, entrusted to you whether you recognize it or not. Is there evidence that, that you know the voice of God and that, and that you respond to him? And so there was no evidence here. There was no evidence that he really feared him, and there certainly was no evidence that he loved him. There was no evidence that he knew him. There was no evidence that he followed him. There was no evidence. And so he convicts him with his own words, and he, and he pronounces his sentence on the spot. And he says something that is also probably, it's the reciprocal of the, of the spiritual principle that we were in earlier. He says, take the gold from him and give it to the one who has 10 bags. For whoever has will be given more, and they will have an abundance. That was the first one. But whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. Now, that was the minor part of the sentence. We'll get into the major part in a minute. When many years ago, I knew this man. He's a bit older than me in Atlanta, and he was a businessman. And years and years ago, uh, back in the late 60s or early 70s, I don't know what exact time period it was, probably the early 70s, 
uh, he went on a business trip to Orlando, Florida. Now, this is Orlando as you and I know it today was not Orlando as it existed back then. It was just basically swampland. It was hot, and it was mosquitoes, and it was, you know, it was just land. It was, there wasn't anything happening down there, and it wasn't even on the beach. It was a little bit inland. Anyway, he went to Orlando on a business trip, and he, and he got on the plane to come home from his business trip. I don't know what he was doing there. Um, but he got on the plane to come home, and he sat next to a man who had, who had these big, um, one of those big tubes with, like, survey papers in it. And he couldn't help but ask, and he asked the man what it was, and the man said, okay, well, I don't mind telling you. I'm going to give you the secret, and I'm also going to give you the tip of a lifetime. This is a true story, by the way. I know you may not believe me, but it's a true story. We'll go find the guy if you insist. Um, but the guy opened up the survey papers, and he showed him a bunch of land, precisely where it was, and the plans that were being made for Disney to create Disneyland, Disney World. Forget land, this is world. And he, and he began to say, uh, Disney is going to come here. They're buying up this land. They're making plans to build this huge theme park. People are going to come from all over the world. It's going to be wildly successful. And, and, and lands, land that costs nothing now will be like infinitely worth so much in the future. And here it is. This is, this is it. It's absolutely coming. It's a done deal. I'm giving you a tip because, I don't know, maybe we had a few drinks on the plane and I'm giving you a tip. And, and if I was you, and this guy had some personal wealth, he'd have been entrusted with God with some personal wealth. If I was you, I'd get back down here as soon as you can, and I would, and I would start buying up land for Disney to have to purchase from you, or even better, for you to develop around Disney with your, with your own hotels or to lease to people who want to develop. Because I'm telling you, if you take advantage of this, your family will have wealth for like the next 200 years. And this guy told me this story from years ago. And he said, I didn't believe him, or I didn't think it was that serious, or well, I don't know why he didn't, but he didn't respond. He never bought, uh, he never bought a, an acre of land. And, and by the time he talked to me, he goes, oh my gosh, what a mistake did I make? And he talked about the mistake he made. He had this opportunity, but he didn't believe in it, so he didn't respond to it. And so he was fine. He went on and, 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 and did well in business and had something. But what I'm saying to you, and what Jesus is saying to us, through this parable and through this kingdom series and all throughout scripture from Genesis to Revelation, he's saying this. He's opening up his plans and he's showing us a picture of the earth. And he's saying to me and he's saying to you, he's saying, I'm about to own all of it. Now, I already do, but it's going to be absolutely clear for 1,000 years. And then I'm going to transform it and redevelop it into perfection. And I'm showing you the plans in advance. And I'm giving you the opportunity to begin to invest in this now on earth, even before heaven comes and it begins to happen. And the difference between me and the difference between you and our conversation with God about his coming kingdom, not the, not the magic kingdom, but the true kingdom, is if we don't invest, not only will we not have it, we will have nothing. You get that? If we don't respond to the king and his sacrifice on the cross and confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that Jesus Christ is Lord, not just call him Lord, but believe that he is Lord and live that he is Lord, submitted to him and receive his sacrifice, be washed in his blood and be filled with his Holy Spirit, submit to that spirit and begin to participate in the kingdom of God on earth as it shall be in heaven, then when the kingdom comes and it's coming, it, it may not be immediate, but it's imminent, then we will have nothing. And not only will what we have be taken from us and given to someone else, we're going to be thrown out. In verse 30, and throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. That's hell. It's all or nothing. You're in the kingdom or you're out of the kingdom. We, we don't even believe in purgatory. That, we don't do that here. There, there is no in-between. Uh, I'll be greatly lauded or I'll be cast out. There, no in-between. And, and the good news is that we have the knowledge and the good news is that we have the inspiration and the good news is no matter who we are or what we seem to have, there's a way for us to participate and to be greatly rewarded. And the severe news is that we got to participate. 
Because grace comes through faith in God's word, which we respond to. What did Jesus say? Jesus said, it's only those who do the will of my Father in heaven that will enter the kingdom of God. What did Paul say with all his talk about grace? He said that the Holy Spirit that exists in you doesn't just exist in you to know the will of God, but to act upon the will of God. What did James say? He said, faith without action is dead. What did John say? The the apostle of love, who all he talked about was love. He quoted Jesus and said, if you say you love him, you better obey him. What is Jesus saying here? If the kingdom of God has come to you and come upon you and exist in you, then it should participate through you. You will be held to account for what you have, not just your spiritual gifts, not just what you do in church. That's even secondary to what is primary, which is the grand sum total of your existence. Where your money is, there your heart is also. What does it look like to me to bury my talents, to bury my treasure, to bury my bag of gold? It, it, I tell you, I thought long and hard about this. It, 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 if, if to produce a profit in the kingdom for me is to plant churches and to raise up pastors and leaders and to make disciples, um, then, then the converse of that would be instead of having a 50 vision for the church, 50 churches and 50 states partnering in 50 nations, we may never get there in my lifetime, but that's our vision. Um, it would be to shrink back to one and just create one comfortable church where I, where I let everybody get comfortable and they made me comfortable. We kind of had a deal. That to me would be burying my treasure. And the scary thing about that is people would laud me for my humility and my faithfulness until Christ came. But when everything was made apparent to him, he'd say, you know what? You wicked, lazy, unfaithful servant. You didn't do that to serve me. You did it to serve you. That's what he's saying to me. Now, the good news is I'm washing his blood. I'm filled with the spirit. If I fall away, he'll bring me back and he will you too. But I bet he's saying something very severe and very challenging and also very inspiring to you at the same time. Remember what I've told you a couple times now. I am much more concerned that you like me when you get to heaven, that you like me when he comes, than you like me now. I wanna challenge you. I wanna prepare you to be ready for that day. That's my calling and I pray that it's your response. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we love you, we praise you, we thank you for your word and your spirit. You have not left us alone as orphans on this earth. You have sent us your son. You have sent us your word. You have sent us your spirit. You send us spirit-filled people to even illuminate your word and help us to understand it and apply it to our own hearts. Lord, I lift up this congregation to you right now and I pray that your kingdom would come and your will would be written upon their hearts. And not only would the spirit in them cause them to know your will, but would cause them to act. I've told them, Lord, how I personally take this passage. I pray that you would speak to them even when I quit speaking and tell them how to apply this passage. Speak to us through it. Lord, I pray that we wouldn't be simply fearful. A little fear can go a long way. It can be a good thing, but I pray that we would be inspired, that we'd feel highly esteemed, that we're being invited to participate in the kingdom of God. I praise you and thank you that you are laying out the blueprints before us and showing us in advance what you're gonna do. How wonderful that is. Thank you for the knowledge of your word. Thank you for the knowledge of your will. Thank you for a sense of vision and a sense of purpose and the power through the blood and through the spirit to respond to that and be faithful. We thank you and praise you that there are laws in here that work for our good. When we bring ourselves into alignment with them, they work for our good. If we're faithful with little, you're gonna give us much. It says so right here. Thank you and praise you that we have the wisdom to understand how to be the faithful servant and not the unfaithful servant. Lord, I pray that you would fill this church up with peace and joy beyond all understanding, but at the exact same time, a discomfort, a holy ambition, a discontent for settling for less. Take away our false humility that that makes us unwilling to leverage and to take risk and fill us with faith and zeal instead. Not worldly ambition, but kingdom inspiration. We can't wait to see what you're gonna do through us, individually as members of this body and collectively the body that is Monterey Church. We love you and praise you, amen.